you hear people say that a 690 or a 701 is the perfect ADV machine. There is no such thing. There's never going to be a unicorn bike because if you just look at the physics of it, a heavy motorcycle is never going to be as good as a dirt bike or a lighter a lighter bike off-road. And it's also a lighter bike is never going to be as good as a heavier adventure bike on the highway. So you have to find that balance. What's going to make you a better filmmaker is literally taking your phone and going out and shooting something and editing it together and it being a good story. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. I'm not saying that I would never own one because it, it's an impressive motorcycle. Every time I've ridden it, it's it's it makes me smile. That's what I love about the adventure segment is that I can hop on my bike out of my garage. I can ride to Texas from North Idaho and I can hit any terrain I want to for the most part. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Backcountry ADV Moto Podcast. Today, I've got a really good one for you. I've got a good friend of mine, Justin Eldeman, on the podcast for you. He is a Navy veteran, a full-time filmmaker, and he is also the adventure liaison for Harley da Red Rock Harley-Davidson in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. So um, we'll go ahead and welcome Justin on. How are you, buddy? What's up, buddy? That was a mouthful. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> you're, you're liaison slash, what did, what did we call that? Uh, you're the ADV adventure. community manager. ADV community manager. Manager. That's a, that's a, it sounds like maybe that's a made up position. <laughs> I mean, uh, it might be truly a new made up position. <laughs> Yeah. Well, dude, if you've got stuff to bring to the table and, uh, you know, Harley can't really figure out where to put you, I mean, that's kind of cool to spearhead that for the, uh, the ADV community for Harley. So, uh, yeah. real quick for the viewers here and for the listeners, cause this is also on, uh, all of the audio streaming channels as well. Um, Justin is, uh, like I said, he's a full-time filmmaker and um, he's been riding motorcycles for quite a while, but he's recently switched over from kind of the road riding into adventure motorcycles. And uh, you've been riding a um, Pan America for about how long? Since 2021 when they came out. Nice. And I, I don't, you don't actually ride for Harley, right? But you're kind of an ambassador for Harley. Is that correct? I don't know what I am, but I'm very passionate about the Pan America. So I seem to keep on getting invited to things. I'm definitely not an ambassador and I, I don't work for Harley other than I just started this, this dealership job. Um, and even that I'm kind of a contractor and I do contract work for corporate Harley. So sometimes they pull me in to do photography and video and have kind of niched myself into being like the ADV content guy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of how we met is, uh, I started noticing some of your stuff on social media, uh, with the Pan America, I have some other friends who have Pan Americas and then your, your name just kind of kept coming up and kind of started putting two and two together that you were kind of working closely on some projects with Harley. And I mean, dude, your, your content is very entertaining. Um, you've done a lot of professional stuff, but you are just starting to get into the YouTube, right? Yeah, so my girlfriend Maggie Hicks and I are actually doing a YouTube channel. It's called The Way We Roam. And the whole thing is basically there's kind of a few different buckets of content, but the primary ones are going to be this rider's guide, which we're starting in the Vegas area. And the idea is sort of to have a backcountry discovery route, but that's in the backyard and something that you can do in a day or two. Uh, and then we'll have some stuff that sort of talks about equipment and, you know, how to gear up your bike. You can see my bike back here. It's totally adventure ready. And yeah, we want to talk about that kind of stuff. And some of it's like my girlfriend and I are going to have debates. Like, why should you wear all of modular versus having all your armor built in? You know what I mean? And it's kind yeah. of cool because we definitely have split opinions about these things. And that's kind of some of the stuff we're going to cover. Well, I think it's really cool too, because, um, you're, you're fairly new to the adventure riding, I guess, niche, um, coming from, you know, the roadside where all this extra equipment generally isn't something sports that anybody, bike. yeah, no one really, I mean, you think about it, I guess, as far as like sport bike and stuff, but as far as like the cruiser and like your typical Harley crowd, no one's really thinking about like, you know, modular armor or what's better and really what you need off road. So, um, I think the content that you've got coming down the pipe is pretty good because 
um, it's it's going to be really geared towards people who, uh, who are just kind of getting into the sport, just like yourself and your like real time lessons learned. So um, pretty excited about it, man. Uh, what is the YouTube channel called again? The Way We Roam. The Way We Roam. So does definitely check that one out on YouTube. Head over there and subscribe. Um, what just kind of getting back to um, a little bit about you you said i told the, the viewers here you have a military background let's go ahead and go into that just a little bit kind of touch on that and give me kind of the 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 quick version life story quick version of like where you've come from and what you do now oh man <laughs> there is not a cliff notes version of this dude <laughs> but can i curse yeah. you guys can edit yeah that. okay cool it's totally fine. um all right yeah i mean there's a real crazy story, but I won't get into that now. If you want to hear some more of that, go to uh, Danger Dan did a pretty cool podcast with me, and he's got a little bit more in depth on that. But um, yeah, as far as you know, I w I went to high school right outside New York City and in New Jersey, and so 9/11 hit home very close to home. We had kids who lost both their parents in the Twin Towers, and so that was sort of my reason for joining the military. And then I joined the Navy after I went into the army recruiting office. It was all dusty and like, you know, took my ASVAB there. And my stepdad was like, you know, you like sailing, you like being on the ocean. Why don't you join the Navy? And I was like, I'll check out their recruiting office. I walked in there, they gave me a mug and they said, Hey son, how about a uniform that will get you laid? And I was like, Oh hell yeah, I'm joining the Navy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, and then uh, I was a helicopter mechanic for five years and I did two deployments, one in the Northern Arabian Gulf. And then I did one that was a counter narco terrorism uh, deployment and we chased down drug runners and played that whole game for six months. So yeah, pretty wild, great experience. You know, best decision was joining the Navy. Second best decision was getting out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of the common thing for a lot of people in the military. I mean, I did 13 years and it was kind of bittersweet getting out, but, um, it was time for sure. I opened up the door for a lot of other new things. Uh, speaking of that, it looks like, you know, based off of just kind of what we've talked about and, you know, if we go to your, um, links under your Instagram, uh, you mentioned sailing, you've done a lot, quite a bit of sailing, right? I mean, any, anything from like, kind of like dinky little sailboat to these massive, massive sailboats and have made some pretty cool, uh, documentaries. Um, tell, tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So I grew up on a sailboat. That's part of the bigger crazy story. Uh, and crossed the Pacific when I was seven to 10 years old. And wow. then, um, and that, so I've always had this sort of like affinity towards the ocean. I love sailing. I love being on the ocean. And, uh, in 2000, 13 or 14 or something like that. I got hired by a group on the East coast to come do some coverage on a sailboat race called the Volvo ocean race. And they were like, yeah, we know you like sailing. And I always was doing like sort of the extreme filming. So it was like, I was always doing crazy slow motion. I was always doing time lapse and got into gimbals and drones and all that stuff really early. Like I was an early adopter. So I was sort of like the specialty camera guy. And they're like, we're going to do some sailing stuff, Edelman. Why don't we have you come out? And we know you like that stuff. So we went out. And the first thing that we did was we interviewed this guy on this boat. And he was the onboard reporter. And his job was to go out to sea with these sailboats. So there, there was actually eight boats or something like that. Each one had an onboard reporter. And their job was to go out, photograph, take five photographs a day and shoot video and then shoot that over a satellite back to home base or they would edit a documentary or whatever and i was like dude this is what i was born for you know what i yeah. mean like uh yeah. so i you had the passion of the videography went, and then you had the passion of the sailing all mixed into one yeah and they, they called it the everest of journalism because it's some of the hardest filming you could do in the world because you're oh, in the wow. southern ocean and you know, it's just like the worst conditions and it is hard. It's really hard to film at sea. So it was cool because after that, I went back to San Diego and I was like, I just changed my mindset. I was like, I'm every job I do, I'm going to be an onboard reporter, <laughs> you know, so I'm always going to take photos and I'm going to put together a video. So I started doing that and it was really cool because that started actually opening up a lot of um, opportunity for me because 
I would go on set and work as a specialty camera operator, but I was taking cool behind the scene pictures because I was trying to practice. And then people yeah. were like, dude, these are, these are rad. I would send them to the whole crew afterwards. And so then that started opening up opportunities for me to do more photography and, you know, and then it was like, and then people just wanted me on set because I had like, I was always doing these cool photos. And then I started going to all the different yacht clubs in San Diego. And I was like, Hey, if you guys have a race or something, let me know. I want to film it because I wanted to learn how to film on the ocean. And then one day there was an open call for this onboard reporter's application. And I was like, all right, here's my chance, you know? And so yeah. 10,000 applicants and out of 10,000 applicants, they narrowed it down to a hundred. They cut 70 and I made it into the top 30. Wow. And then, then I shot over to Portugal and I started doing some filming with them. And honestly, what ended up happening is I got over there and as the kind of curtain was lifted, I was like, oh man, this is a shit show. It was super disorganized. And also on top of that, they were just not going to, they had changed how their, the pay structure was. And so they were just not going to pay me very well. And mm. it sucked because it was kind of like my dream come true. But then when I kind of got, when I got there, I realized that it wasn't going to be what I wanted it to be. Um, but anyway, I had at that point made myself, you know, one of the top cinematographers on the ocean in the world, you know, and had yeah. niched down in this like really specialty thing. Um, and then I kept working in the sailing scene. I got a great opportunity actually after the onboard reporting thing. And I ended up uh, taking that where I was making a documentary for a couple of years and traveling around the world. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I was, uh, I still was like doing all the sailing coverage and I just kind of got burned out, dude. It was like the sailing industry is stuck in the 1970s and, you know, it's like, trying to explain to them like hey like if you want to get people interested in this dying sport you know that it has been basically like unobtainium for most of the population you got to yeah. make something that's interesting to everybody i'm like you know it's like if you watch that drive to survive or you know the one about the formula one on netflix it's like you need to do something like that for sailing and it just like people are like what's netflix <laughs> i mean it's not that bad yeah. but you know yeah. like it was it just, just like taken dude, off. i can't do that and also the you know it's just like there's the sport is still very sexist and the opportunities for women wasn't very good and i had a couple situations where i was just like i'm done i'm burned out and then this motorcycle thing kind of came up and that's it was cool because there's so much correlation between sailing and adventure riding you know, like it's got yeah. that whole bipolar nature. Uh, there's this whole element of survival. You know what I mean? Like, and and as far as filmmaking goes, it's on, on the L, it's on the extreme end still, and I like that. That's where I thrive. So, and there, it's just that challenge. It's like, all right, well, you're on a boat. How do you make the thing about being on a boat is like, first of all, every day you don't know what you're going to deal with weather wise. So it's like, how do I? How do I capture, you know, these crazy waves today and, and capture the people doing what they're doing when everything's soaking wet, you know? Right. And then it's like, and that, and then there's like three days where there's no wind and it's boring as hell. So how do you like <laughs> make that interesting, you know? Um, yeah. And, and then in so, terms of survival, I'm guessing too, I mean, like you're very limited on resources. You have to kind of ration out like you know, what your time out on the water. So it's kind of, kind of similar. Wow. It's a good, a good transition. Like you said, into adventure motorcycling and that was actually that a good it's a good transition into my next question is that what got you into wanting to to be out and be on an adventure motorcycle um as much as i mean that's pretty much all you do now besides you know your side projects yeah right um i mean it was a weird serendipitous kind of transition i guess i so i've known my girlfriend for a long time and she and I had kind of re we had, we met up after not seeing each other for a very very long time. She was living overseas, and um, she bought a Harley Davidson and was like, "I'm gonna go do a trip to all four corners of the U.S." And I was like, "Well, that's cool. Do you have any sponsors?" And she said, "No." And I was like, "Well, what do you say we put together a little film and see if we can't get you some sponsorship for this trip?" So I was like, "All right, cool." So I 
I went out to Vegas. We filmed. We went up to Utah. And then we've got, she was working in a marketing agency that had a couple contacts at Harley. So she sent this video in an email to Harley. And they responded and said, we love this video. And we'd like to support you. We want to loan you one of our new bikes. It's called the Pan America. Oh, wow. And so that was that was my introduction to the Pan America. It was like, oh, cool. After all this work we had done, this was the reward. And I didn't know anything about adventure riding. Like I rode sports bikes. I actually, to be totally honest, I thought Harleys are kind of lame. They're slow and heavy and, you know, like not really. I just, you know, my thoughts have changed to be clear. But yeah, uh, at yeah. first it was just like, why would I buy this big heavy thing when I can have this super agile machine? You know, and I wasn't doing long distance trips. You know, I was just kind of ripping around. It was supposed to be like motorcycling for me was like a weekend thing. And, you know, it wasn't, I didn't have a community like any of that stuff. So anyway, the Pain America pops up and I was like, that's cool because I can actually ride it for a long time comfortably. It's fast and it is agile and it has the ability to go off road and i did do dirt biking when i was a kid but you know i'm not like a dirt kid you know right. and um and i was just like man from a filmmaking standpoint i could load up all my gear in these cases and like and then i could shoot ahead of people and maybe because it's off road capable i could get to a good perch and shoot down and film people so it was like immediately it was like this utility vehicle that's the, that's yeah. where the thought process was. And then, uh, I went after that, she got the, the bike and she did some stuff with it. She put like three or 4,000 miles on this one bike. And then, uh, um, then we had another opportunity to where she was riding into Sturgis <clears throat> with another, um, influencer and they were doing sort of this off-road entry into Sturgis. And so I took the opportunity to go and film them and make a film out of it. And it was basically like a spec piece, like no one asked for it. Um, but I was like, whatever, this is my opportunity to sort of like shine and maybe Harley will like this. Right. So made the video, yeah. sent it to Harley and they're like, this is cool. Can we license it from you? And I was like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> you <know>? uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And then in that trip, that's when I was like, I really like this bike. You know, I went back and I was like, I'm going to, I put a deposit down on a bike. And then Maggie's like, don't you dare get a bike. You don't need a bike right now. You got all this life stuff you need to deal with. You know and I was like, all right. And so That's I just kind of talked out of it. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then, and then like, it wasn't long after that I was like, nope, I'm going to go get this bike. So I went in and got the Pan America and that was it. That, and then from that point, what ended up happening was that was when the whole world of ADV opened up to me. So I went, the first event I went to was one of the backcountry discovery route film screenings. And oh, cool. I was like, yeah, I was like, Oh, Whoa, this is way more than what I thought it was. Like, I didn't know this whole, I didn't know this community. I didn't know this whole world. I didn't understand this whole, like, mm -hmm. I didn't even know about like long way around, long way down, long way across, whatever. You know, like, so I started, I started watching all those films. I, you know, got really into going to the ADV rallies. I had a couple people like pull me in and, and want to mentor me and teach me how to ride. Um, a couple of people were like, dude, you make cool content, but obviously you don't know how to ride a motorcycle very well. <laughs> so that's when, uh, kind of had that entrance into the new world of ADV. Awesome. Yeah. And, and adventure writing is, it's a whole different animal just as the writing goes. Cause I mean, anybody that has any kind of experience can take an adventure bike and ride it on the road. It's, it's the same riding on the road as most other bikes, but then you take that motorcycle off road and even, even something simple as just riding a gravel road. I mean, I, I remember just being like white knuckled, having the bike move underneath me um, when I was brand new to dirt riding, having an adventure bike off road. Cause again, it handles way different than what a dirt bike does. A dirt bike, you don't even think twice about it, but having that, having that big machine move around you, move underneath you and feel like you don't have control of it is pretty unnerving at first. And then, you know, once you get some experience and 
you know that that's just how it is, it becomes extremely fun. But uh, for new riders, that's a it's a huge hurdle to get over it. And, you know, uh, off road and even just like I said, just gravel riding. Um, what what resources have you used? You mentioned you've done a, a little bit of, of riders training. What other resources have you uh, kind of found or come across that have helped you kind of sharpen your skills? Um, okay. That's a good you, question. You, so, you recently so went to Austin Moto Adventures, Austin right? Moto Adventures. Yep. Yeah. So a, a little, okay. So a couple of things. One is I want to point out that I think what was really cool was that it was like a whole new, like it opened up a whole new channel of skills for me to learn, you know, like that was what I was like, Whoa, okay. Like they're there, you know, it's not at all like it. I mean, it is kind of like a dirt bike, but it's not like handling a no. big adventure bike is it's different. You don't, you don't do the same things you can with a dirt bike. And right. Um, so there is some skills that obviously go up from dirt biking to these big bikes, but it's not, it, these handle differently than anything else. So you have to really learn how to deal with, manage them off road. And I think that that's cool. It's cool. It's like unlocking this whole new thing that you can go out and, um, you know, play around with. But so as far as training goes, I hired my friend, Rob day, uh, my friend, Justin Clyder. He also, t he was one of the, he was the first person to take me out and do an adventure ride and also kind of give me an intro to some of the skills, you know, and it, it's all that clutch stuff and, you know, slow movements and counterbalance, you know, and, um, and then, what I ended well, up doing and just, just to, uh, d just to give the listeners and the viewers some, some, uh, backstory on that. Both of those guys you just mentioned are amazing teachers. Um, they've worked for rawhide, they've worked for, um, ATX and, um, have just done and lots of stuff on the side as well. Those guys are kind of, uh, like old school, like you know, teachers when it comes Badasses. to the ADV world. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, don't want to like, just, I don't want to just brush over that. I kind of want to point that out a Give little bit, that. but yeah, yeah I, got, I got pretty, I got pretty lucky. I feel like two of the ADV wizards like pulled me in. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to get mad at me either because I called them old right now, but I didn't call them old. They're wizards. Yeah. It's fine. Right. <laughs> they, just, they just look old. They're like 400 years yeah. old, but they look better than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, I went from that, and then I think this is like an, an important thing to kind of point out is like I feel like sort of the the journey of a new ADV rider is like you know you do some hopefully you do you need to, you really need to do some classes you really need to learn some of the basic skills and you can do that online you can watch videos on YouTube or Chris Birch has a, a great series for I think it's super cheap actually but. Um, yeah, Chris Birch has a class that says say no, or it's say no to slow. Um, but anyway, another great way of kind of getting some skills under your belt is to start going to some of these ADV rallies and ADV rallies are way different than most motorcycle rallies. Like this isn't yeah. about jumping from one water hole to the next. What I found and I loved about going to ADV rallies is I got there and first of all, it's a bunch of nerdy guys who like gear like me and that's a big <laughs> part of it. Right. And then yeah. another thing was, is like, everybody's in bed at 10. Like they're not staying up all night to get wasted. They're in bed at 10 because they're going to wake up super early the next morning to go ride, you know? And yeah. that, so that's, it's, it's a more about thing. the, it's more about the riding than it is the partying. You know, you don't have somebody firing up their V twin at three in the morning and just revving the crap like out of it just burning, because they're doing burnouts. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's it's way totally. it's way more mellow, and I think the community it's it's a lot more community based instead of like testosterone based. I think <laughs> yeah, it's way less ego. I mean, barely. Yeah. I wouldn't say there's much ego in it at all, you know. And anyway, uh, they have clinics at those things usually, yeah. and that's a great place to sort of just get a couple days in, and it's not it's not the full experience, you know. Like there are places like Rawhide and. Um, my favorite is awesome moto adventures. I think that they're great. The, uh, terrain there is awesome. Their entire setup. And that was recently I did their level one and two class there. And, uh, it's, it's just, it's like luxury meets adventure training. <laughs> 
And yeah, um, and, and jo- Josh was actually on the last podcast, and he talks a little bit about that. Josh, you know, we both know Josh, and he's kind of a guru yeah. as well as far as the instruction goes. And he's he's the uh, VP of operations there now, and um, really helping that that place get off the ground. And they have a lot of really good. Well, that's that's where Rob where Rob works now, and um you know, a few other people that have been around in the community. So I'll be doing some stuff with them as well here in the near future, probably in March. And I can't wait, man. Like it, I feel like I'm pretty seasoned when it comes to adventure writing, but you can never, like you just never stop learning. You know, there's so always, you're always, habits. always going to learn something. You know what I yeah, mean? Like there's no matter that you, that you end up making and that they will break that, that are good. You know, you need to make sure that you're not always develop or you're make, make sure that you're not developing bad habits. So, yeah. For sure. Sorry, yeah, I so, you again. <laughs> no, you're okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, that's it. It's just awesome motor adventures. And uh, t- that was the real, like, three days of just training. And, you know, there was a lot that I learned there. And that's, Very I cool. think, the, the one thing I'll say about training in general is, like, you know, I can buy whatever parts for this bike. I got a Yoshimura exhaust, whatever. But, you know, that those things don't necessarily carry on to the next bike that I get. But the one thing that always does carry on is the skills that you pick up through training and education. And also, you know, dude, we're both military guys. We know exactly how valuable training is and why we need it and what it does for you, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of people overlook that, you know, they go out and they'll buy, you know, an expensive motorcycle and they don't want to invest in themselves to making themselves better. When at the end of the day, uh, having the training and having the skill is, is what's going to get you, well, especially when you're out on, you know, in the, in the back country or whatever, you know, it, it, that's, what's going to get you through the day. Um, and it's also, it's a safety thing, man. I mean, um, if you, it, it, to take a bike, that we ride out and not, not know how to handle it. It's going to, it can get you in a situation that you don't want to be in pretty fast. So I think if you're going to invest any money right out of the gate as a new rider, yes, all the, the bolt on stuff looks cool. Um, and exhaust sounds awesome, but I tell everybody, man, training or getting sharpening your skills. And then the number two thing usually is suspension. But again, that's bike stuff, but, uh, those, those are like the first two things that people always overlook. Uh, sure. so let's, let's move on a little bit. Uh, we talked about resources. Um, are there any specific, well, there's a project that you just got doing, got done doing and you got, I would just brush on it really quick. You don't have to go into it cause I know it's kind of super secret squirrel stuff, but you just got done writing in New Zealand. What was that experience? I'm assuming was amazing. Are there any other, uh, destinations that you've got kind of on the, the radar that you want to hit up really soon? Yeah, for sure. Um, Let's see. So New Zealand real quick. Uh, it's, yeah, that was, we can, so, we can touch really, on it. I just didn't want to give too much. Yeah, sure. So New Zealand, first of all, I will have an episode on my YouTube channel on it. Uh, it was an interesting trip. I mean, I went with Justin Kleider, who is my mentor and friend and yeah, dude, like it ended up being more of an expedition, which I haven't really done something like that before. Justin Kleider, just to give some backstory like he's gone and done mongolia he's gone all the way down to south america all on adv bikes and you know touched on pieces of africa so he's seasoned and you know has been the person who kind of like you know if you look at the 12 step story of a hero's journey or whatever like he's kind of the one who like is the mentor who brought me into the new world um and he's i mean yeah so he on this trip, we really, he really wanted to try to cover as much ground as possible and, and off-road as possible. Yeah. And that's an interesting challenge when you've never been to that country before. I have been there, but not on a motorcycle. And it was right. a long time ago, you know? And so, uh, it's an interesting challenge because you don't know what the terrain's like. You don't know, like it's, first of all, they, they call it freedom camping, but dispersed camping or whatever is not legal there. You can't just camp wherever like we can on BLM, right? So the thing with adventure riding is like, well, if I get going and I go too late, worst case scenario is I'll just stop somewhere and throw my tent up and sleep it out until the sun comes back up. Right. 
Whereas in New Zealand, that's technically not legal. And gotcha. then on top of that, we just don't know how far apart gas stations are or how difficult the drain's going to be. So that was an interesting challenge. And, we, you know, like we got down there and it was just like, go, 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 go. And there were so many times where I was like, this is so beautiful, but I'm experiencing it at 80 kilometers an hour. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, yeah, so, yeah. Um, but it was a really good educational type of trip where I now I understand the difference between an expedition and a tour you know um, right. so yeah New Zealand New Zealand was on the list I've ridden Pan Americas now in India and New Zealand uh, the next cool. the next big trips that I'd like to do uh, there is a relationship with Australia because of New Zealand so that's mm-hmm. on my map I really would like to go to and ride around Australia and I really really want to go to South Africa and I want to ride up to Namibia. Um, that's yeah. super high on the list. I mean, I think that that's probably, I, I think I'm probably going back to India this year and I actually want to ride Pan Americas in the Himalayas. I did it, Pan, wow. I did Himalayans, Himalayans on, in the Himalayas, but now I really want to do a Pan America. I mean, the bike is Himalayas, like a Himalayan is like a little tractor. I mean, it's a right. great bike, super reliable. The nice thing is everybody knows how to fix them in India. If right, one of them right. breaks, there's probably one laying in a gutter or in the ravine down there that they can pull parts off of, you know, whereas a Pan America is like this like super machine that is unobtainium for most people over there. So uh, it's going to be a challenge in itself with that in mind, but I really want to do it. It's fun. Such a fun bike, you know? So, um, and then same thing, Australia, I want to do it on Pan Americas, South Africa, I want to do it on Pan Americas. Uh, and my goal is to try to get on as many continents and countries as possible riding a Pan America, you know, like very cool. Just, now it's like, why the hell not? Yeah, for sure. We, um, uh, us and Phil craft two years ago had really talked about trying to do Pan Americas from Morocco to, um, to Jerusalem. And there was a lot of stuff that was involved in that. And that was when the front Pan, Pan America just kind of first came out. And then there's also been obviously a lot of issues in the in the Middle East lately, so that has been put on the back burner. But I mean, just going through Libya and Egypt and all that would just be freaking epic in North Africa, along the Mediterranean. Um, I think we still have you know that on in our sights, but uh, we'll just have to see. And I don't know, maybe we can get Harley on board to support that somehow. So uh, you know, we just got to know some people. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, it helps. It <laughs> but, definitely uh, helps. It helps to take good pictures, make cool content, and just, you know, it's like, I can't tell you how many times, dude, it's like with the Pan America, it's such an interesting thing because I get it. Like, dude, I had an opinion about Harley Davidson well before I ever got a Pan America. And to be completely honest, I never would have bought a Harley Davidson if it wasn't for the Pan America. The bike, right. this bike was, it, this bike was the, it's what brought me into the family. And not only that, but opened my eyes up to ADV. And I honestly, I, like, I remember seeing ADV bikes before and I was like, those things are so ugly, you know, like no <laughs> offense, but I just yeah. was like, they look to me, they all look like bugs that got their heads bit off, you know? And <laughs> I really, I liked the Pan America. I just thought it was like such a cool looking bike. It's a and very then unique, the utility- unique bike for sure. Yeah, and then the utility of it. And the thing is, is like now that I have been in the ADV community as long as I have, what I can say is like, dude, Harley came out hitting heavy with this bike. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is up until recently, it was the most technologically advanced adventure bike. It's 150 horsepower. You know, yeah. it, it's it's fun. It's super fun to ride. If I were to I've ridden the GS, I've ridden Triumphs. Um, you know, I've, I've test ridden a bunch of different bikes and I'm the type of person that when I'm out riding with people who have other bikes and they've never been on the Pan America, I'm like, you want to try my bike out? And they're like, yeah, actually, you know? And so that's my opportunity to be like, cool, this guy's got a KTM 1290. I want to see what this thing's like, you know? Right. And, and it gives me an opportunity to sort of try something else and see what that's like on the trails or whatever. And you know, what I'll say about the Pan America is that it's kind of like the BMWs are a highly refined machine. They're really nice. There's no doubt, right? But right. it's like it's like owning a BMW versus having a Mustang. You know, the, the yeah. Pan America has that like Americana feel. It's powerful. Like it feels like 
big ass dirt bike. Yeah. It's a fun yeah. bike, you know? I, I, I rode it in 2021 when they first came out and uh, at Giant Loop, actually. And then they had a little off-road course set up. And, dude, I you know I, I had my my thoughts just by the first looks at it that it was going to be kind of a okay bike. And I was really impressed by it. I, w- I would say probably the only reason I haven't bought one was because I wanted to give it a few years. And, uh, of course, I got a really good deal on my BMW. But... Um, I, I'm not saying that I would never own one because it, it's an impressive motorcycle. Every time I've ridden it, it's, it's, it makes me smile. And, um, like you said, the, the, the technology that it's got on it is pretty awesome. I mean, I'm pretty short. So having that, that freaking adjustable, adjustable height, ride is, height. It, adjustable ride height is awesome. And then I'm excited when I do go up to, um, also, or down to awesome moto ventures that I'm actually going to spend some time on that bike. I was supposed to they, go down with right, Josh. They rent them out there. Yeah. I was supposed to go down with Josh here in February and do, um, the scouting mission for the, um, the BDR X for a Texas down in, um, oh, what is that big bend? But it, it just didn't work out in my schedule. And I would, I was excited about it. Cause I was going to get to spend a week on one of those things, you know, really get a feel for it. But uh, I'll get my time for sure. Um, but the, the Pan America, it's, it's no slouch, man. I think that people had, I think people just have a, I, and, and I don't understand it. I don't understand why people have turned their nose up at it so much because even the spec sheet, even if you don't, if, if you were to take the specs of that bike and take the brand name off of it and put it out there, it blows so many other bikes out of the water. So I don't, I don't understand. I think, I think people, I think people will eventually come around um, to, to Harley and they'll see that the, the value that it offers, because even, even for the price, I mean, it, it is, it is, in the, yeah, it is in the higher, um, I guess realm for adventure bikes, but there's way, there's several other bikes that are higher than that. That are and way you, more expensive. You, yeah. And you get a lot for your money. So Definitely. this is not a sales pitch yeah, for Harley think, by I any think means. It, no, no, not at all. But there's a couple of things. First of all, I have to say what's been funny is that even in New Zealand, dude, like people are like, oh yeah, you know, I, you can't do this on a big adventure bike, you know? And it was, it, it was just a big adventure bike period. Right. But then add yeah. in it's Harley Davidson, you know, and it was really cool to be like, all right, like not to be a schmuck and be like, oh, I'll take the challenge. But it's like, no, yeah. actually like you can do it on a big adventure bike. And the nice thing about this bike and most of the adventure bikes is that like our New Zealand expedition, dude, we had to crush some slab, you know what I mean? And it was enjoyable and was comfortable yeah. and we had all our stuff with us, you know, to hit the slab for a while. And then when we hit the dirt, guess what? It's super fun, you know? And yeah. I think that's been something that's been fun, like being one of the early adopters. And I had no idea about anything related to ADV, but you know, I was out there and I'm new and I'm starting to I'm doing these things on this bike. And people are like, Whoa, I didn't think Harley's could do that. I didn't think the Harley yeah. Pan America was able to do that, you know? And, um, so that's been cool. Just kind of like change some perspective and mind on it. The other thing too, that, and I don't know if this is like a real true story. This is just something that I've heard, but the engineers at Harley, uh, there are a few that were ADV riders and mm-hmm. they were, they had BMWs and other bikes. Right. And I think, from the story that I heard is that a lot of them were playing around with ideas that if Harley ever were to make an adventure bike, what would they do? And there was things like the Brimbo brakes and, you know, the adjustable ride height and all this stuff that they had kind of dreamt up. And then one day they got the go ahead, like, Hey, this is a, you know, ADV is one of the fastest growing segments. And, you know, we're trying to expand our family and let's go for it. You know what I mean? And these guys were like, yes, you know, and, I think there's a lot of people out there. I know a handful of people who have a cruiser Harley and an ADV bike, you know, a BMW or whatever. And so now this is that, now you can have the Harley in the garage, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think what's cool. And as you mentioned, and, and Lori uh, from Outback Motor and Tech and I talked about this on a, on a previous podcast too, is that it seems like a lot of adventure riders are kind of wanting to transition to this lighter weight motorcycle. Like they're converting KTM 500s or, you know, they're, you hear people say that a, at a 690 or a 701 is the perfect ADV machine. And there is no such thing. There's never going to be a unicorn bike because if you just look at the physics of it, 
a heavy motorcycle is never going to be as good as a dirt bike or a lighter, a lighter bike off road. And it's also a lighter bike is never going to be as good as a heavier adventure bike on the highway. So you have to find that balance. I mean, the T seven does a pretty good job of it. The, um, the Ducati does a pretty good job of it. The tour egg does a pretty good job of it. But again, all three of those bikes aren't perfect. And r- being somebody who has ridden just about everything. I think the only thing I haven't ridden in, in the new age of adventure bikes is the new, uh, the Honda trans out, but you know, the T seven is amazing off road, especially once you put proper suspension on it. But after about three hours on the highway, you want to get off that thing, you know, at least take a couple hour break or so. Whereas my BMW, man, I can ride that all, I can ride a thousand miles on that bike and not be sore when I get off of it. And I think the Pan America is the same way. It's one of those bikes that you can, you can ride most actual adventure terrain, because I think a lot of people too, just to kind of spin off of that. I think a lot of people that come from the dirt bike world, they want to take adventure bikes on this gnarly enduro, you know, you know, big single track or, or wide single track or two track. And the adventure bikes can do it, but it's not what it's made for. You're going to, you're going to beat the bike up and you're going to probably end up breaking something or breaking yourself at the end of the day, because it's just, that's just not what those bikes are designed for. The adventure bikes are designed for adventure touring for the most part. So going on and off road, it's a big dual sport motorcycle. You can do both. And I think if people keep that in mind, that that's what they're intended for, then they'll be happy with what they purchase. But if they go into an adventure bike thinking that they're going to, you know, go ride the same stuff that they ride on the weekends on their 450, they're going to be unhappy with it. And I I think people just need to kind of get that into their mind. And that's what I love about the adventure segment is that I can hop on my bike out of my garage. I can ride to Texas from North Idaho and I can hit any terrain I want to, for the most part in, in between anything, I mean, for the most part, anything that a, a Jeep can go on adventure bikes can go on. So I don't know. That's yeah, just think, kind of my I think another, another, another thing to point out to you with some of these OEMs is like the dealer network is super important to keep in mind when you're doing adventure yeah. riding, you know, like any, cause the cool thing about Harley, for example, is they're everywhere to you know like yeah they're all around the world and same with bmw right like there's a really good dealer network and that's really important because the reality is like dude these bikes you were i'm hard on mine you know and you got to get new tires and you got to get you got to do servicing like if you're going to go crush you know the distance from here to south america you know, to Ushuaia, like, yeah, you're going to have multiple servicings you need to get done in between here and there. Yeah. And so ha- having that dealer network is, that's, that's a vital piece of like the expedition and adventure planning, you know? Yeah. And that's another thing about Harley too. And you mentioned is that, I mean, gosh, there's, <laughs> I mean, no matter what state you're in, there's multiple dealerships for Harley. Whereas, you know, you go to other brands like, you know, Ducati or anything like, you know, there's you're going to struggle to even maybe even have maybe one one. maybe here in las vegas we have we have three in las vegas yeah and then josh was talking about in texas around austin i think i think i can't remember what the number is but it's insane between dallas austin and houston there's like 50 plus dealerships i mean you pick just pick one you know so uh having having that is definitely a plus when it comes to adventure bike segment well, I think we've uh, I think we've beat that up a little bit. I think people understand our opinions <laughs> on the adventure bike. That is, you know, humbly that it's the it's the best segment you can be in if you're going to ride a motorcycle. But <laughs> um, yeah, right. Let's kind of sure. switch. Let's let, let's switch over to a little bit of your cinematic photography or videography background. Um, I know that you've done uh, a lot of documentaries and and stuff like that, and you have plans to do similar stuff off the motorcycle. So for people who you know, may have a, a YouTube channel that are watching this, or they want to just document their own trips it, it, for social media or not. And if they want to make their own home to call it home videos of their travels, what, what camera gear do you use? And maybe let's talk about three or four pieces of gear that a, a new videographer could get in, could, could purchase to get in and actually start making quality videos for, you know, their, their adventures. 
Um, I think before we even start on equipment, I think there's something more important to sort of chat about. And that's like, when it comes to all these things, first of all, understanding what the end goal is, you know, like, why are you building a YouTube channel? You know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, the people in Hollywood who are actors, it's like, why are you an actor? Well, somebody says, because I want to be famous, like that's not a very good reason to be an actor. Right. right? But if you Mm -hmm. are an actor because you enjoy getting into character and because you enjoy entertaining people, you know, there's, that's a good reason I think to be an actor. Right. And so I think the same kind of goes with filmmaking. It's like, and YouTube and all that, like, if you're going to do this, you better love it. Cause if you don't, you're going to really hate it. And it's hard. It takes a lot of work. Um, so I think, and he's part of like the conversation with yourself needs to be what's the end goal and even like to take that a step further i do what i do with a lot of businesses is actually strategy when it comes to video so it's like video is a tool you know like i, I literally can as a filmmaker a documentarian you can change the world like that's cool you know, like you can change people's opinions like we all know like look at all the political ads out there look at the documentaries that have changed people's eating habits and you know like it it, you can have a huge impact with video and that's i think that's exceptional somebody watching this video today could be like i don't even i never knew about adventure riding but i like what these guys talked about today i want that you know what i mean like we have the power to change lives and all that and i think the other thing is once you get into youtube like it's one thing to be like, I just want to make videos and get views and likes and all that. But for what reason? You know what I mean? Like if in the end of the day, it should be like, in, I have a business that I'm trying to market or I'm going to, I w- one day I want to teach classes about the thing that I'm filming. Like you don't need to be a filmmaker who's going to sell filmmaking, but you could right. be somebody who's like um, a survivalist who's selling survival kits. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, or you could be, um, somebody who is really into knitting and you're just learning the art of filmmaking to be able to express your passion for knitting, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and then eventually you're going to have online courses for knitting and that's what you're trying to sell. So I think there needs to be like this end goal. And then, you know, then the next thing when it comes to filmmaking is understanding that it doesn't matter what gear you use or what you have. Ultimately, the most important thing is how good can you tell a story and or how good can you break down some information so it's understandable to a lot of people? So it's almost better to be really good at PowerPoint and presentations than it is to uh, be really good at making beautiful photos, you know what I mean? Or taking yeah. beautiful shots because at the end of the day, like there's this guy who I worked with recently and I don't know if you know what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, but it's basically where so somebody doesn't realize what they don't know. And so this guy, yeah. you know, got some nice camera gear and he had a gimbal and a drone and all this. And he's out there and he's literally, it's like he's jumping from one thing to the next. And, you know, and then he's like, and then he puts together this cinematic masterpiece. And it's like, dude, if you understood Dunning-Kruger effect is like, it's what you don't know. You, you know, it's the things that you, you don't realize you're getting into something, a new field. And there's all this stuff up here that you're just not familiar with yet because you haven't been exposed to it. And so anyway, this guy thinks he's made like cinematic gold. And it's like, dude, all you did was make, you got some decent shots that were cinematic. I'll give you that. But like you didn't use any of those tools appropriately. Like a gimbal has a specific time and use and a drone has a specific time and use and a long lens and slow motion and all these things. They are tools and they need to be used appropriately at the right time, right? And, you know, then like he put together this super long video of all these cinematic shots and yeah, it's impressive to you and it's impressive to the people who don't really know how to do any filmmaking, but it's not impressive to the rest of the world. They're going to shut it off after 15 seconds because there's no story. There's nothing there. Right. And so that's, what's really important is to understand how to keep somebody engaged and anyway but I will get into gear because it is exciting. (laughs) So I think, uh, when it comes to gear, you know, if you're just starting out, I would say the Osmo pocket right now, which, you you know, we both have talked about, but that thing is so sweet. It's such a good deal. You have wire. So audio, audio is 50% of a video. People don't realize that 
but it's so important. If I'm at the back of this room right now and I don't have a microphone and you can barely hear me, you're going to shut this off right away. Right? This There's the Osmo Pocket. Osmo Pocket. It's just a cool like yeah. gimbal gimbal camera that shoots, I mean, 4K, really good quality. And like you said, audio-wise, it comes with a wireless microphone and yeah, as you're saying, I mean, the the audio makes or breaks a lot of things you can have amazing footage but if you have crap audio it's just it's hard to watch yep it's it's i mean it's hard to watch or it's not watchable you know right yeah um so i I would say that uh if you're getting into photography and you want to do it professionally then you know i would consider i i'm a sony guy but canon and and uh you know all the brands have good cameras now it's the reason i went down the sony route was because i feel that they are they push the envelope when it comes to video so their their photo yeah. cameras are great but they've always been sort of like they've packed technology in their cameras that the other brands weren't doing early on so like canon didn't really have slow motion features whereas sony was like packing crazy 240 frames per second bursts at 1080p way back like 10 years ago you know, and yeah. that's what, that, like that put, that literally put me on the map. I was like the slow mo guy, you know. And the only other way you could do that kind of stuff was to have a red camera, which was like fifty thousand dollars. And I obviously, when I got started, I couldn't afford that. So it was cool to right. like have these tools accessible early on. So I like Sony's, and I think that if you're going to get into professional photography, it's worth the investment of getting a good camera body. I mean, you have the A6600 or whatever. What is it? A6700, yeah. A6700. So that's a good one. Like, it's a it's a small sensor, uh, but you can still take really good photos with it. It's super affordable. And the nice thing about it is it's E-mount. So if you start buying lenses for it, like, the big thing is actually lenses are the investment because that's yeah. what's going to last a long time. You know, like, that's that thing that I was talking about earlier. You know, this exhaust isn't necessarily going to transfer over onto the next bike. But there are some right. things that will. Well, the, the lenses are that thing that's going to transfer into the next body that you buy. So the thing is you yep. can spend less money on a body, get comfortable, start learning, getting good at it. And then as you start to build up your money, you can be like, well, I'm going to pull the trigger on this $2,700 lens. But just know that $2,700 lens that's full frame is going to last you for 10 years. You know, yep. And that's going to jump from from your small sensor camera to your full frame camera and works seamlessly into the next one. So that's where you kind of invest your, your glass and, or sorry, your money into glass. And then, yeah. Um, I don't know, drones and, you know, like all these things, gimbals and drones are worth having. I think drones have gotten really played out in a lot of videos. So, everybody is yeah. in the beginning it was awesome because everybody was just like whoa this is so cool but now it's like all right this is not the proper use of a drone i think that for what we do having a drone is super interesting because yeah you know when it ki- when, it, when it comes to that situation where we're le- where we, we we're trying to go and work our way through sections nowadays because the drone battery is last 40 minutes i can leave a drone in the air I have, I actually attach my controller to my handlebars. And so what I do is I ride through the shot with my group of people. And then as soon as we get outside the frame, then basically I reposition, reposition. the drone, fly it over. Yeah. And this one has a wide angle and a zoom lens so I can get the cinematic looking shot and same thing. And all of a sudden I can have us riding through the shot, you know, out the back. And so it's cool. Now I'm able to build out a bunch of shots that if the only other way to do that would be for me to haul ass on the motorcycle way up ahead, bust out my big camera, wait for somebody to come, you know, they pass through, then I got to get back, pack my stuff back up and blast past them again and do that. And at the amount of time it takes to do that is a lot, you know? So and uh, the I, I think that's a good point. Cool. Um, I, I think people in this day and age, man, you don't have to have like professional grade, <clears throat> professional grade gear to be able to, produce something that is professional looking. I mean, this, this has a one inch sensor, so it's a, it's got a pretty good sensor in this pocket. Um, it's, it'll shoot in a log flat format. It'll shoot, um, you know, slow motion, all that stuff. Um, helmet cams, 
like like your your DJI Osmo Action Four. In my opinion, this is better hands down than what a than what a GoPro is. Um, lots of reasons that I'll, I'll go. I'll I'll make a video for all the stuff that I carry. But there's there's small, you know, we're limited on space and on a motorcycle. So there's there's this small handheld gear that, you know, th that's two cameras right there that that don't take up hardly any room and are. I mean, they can produce a professional with the right story can pr produce a professional video just in, in those two things right there, you know, and, uh, do I carry a, a bigger camera sometimes, but also sometimes I don't want to get it messed up. So sometimes I don't bring it, you know, because the dust, yeah. the environment, the water, all that stuff, do I want to ruin a $1,500 camera from the elements? Whereas these are way easier to replace. I mean, uh, and then you talk about drones. Well, he's getting that. I think it's really important to point out like this box right here. My goal when I go ride now is I have to try to get all the gear that I'm going to use to film in just that box. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I so mean, it has to be small, this, compact. And this is the drone that I carry. And again, it's not, it's not the best drone that DJI makes, but it's amazing for low light. It has a, a it has a one inch sensor and it will do the job. I mean, for, for what we do, especially for YouTube, because YouTube does, uh, you know, it, it degrades the film once you, or the video, once you upload it anyway, even at 4k, it's not truly 4k. So I feel like those three things alone for uh, somebody who's getting started with those three tools, you can produce just about anything with I me. Mean, and I mean, the, the thing that we carry in our pocket every single day will produce a really good video. The phone does a so really that's, good job. So that's that's a well. really really good point. So we recently upgraded to the iPhone 15s, and it yeah. is just simply because, like, dude, I can quickly pull that out and get those shots, you know, and and it's good. And it, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> all right, I will say there is like a level of understanding when you do work with professional cameras. Like, I mean, I've worked with the top cinema cameras in the world and so when you when you there are things like compressing space with a long lens and like yeah. there there are cinematic tools that you can use that help tell the story or whatever or can make things look more cinematic <clears throat> so like one of the downsides to the osmo pocket if that's your only camera you're pretty much limited to it being a wide angle it will do a digital zoom but it's yeah. not there's a difference between having an optical compression optical zoom of yeah. the background and not even optical zoom but if i have a telephoto lens oh yeah that's you know instead of being zoomed in telephoto which uh basically what will happen is like i can have something like this really epic mountain in the background and a subject and the way that it optically compresses things so it looks like that person's standing almost up against that big mountain in the background and you know it's whereas like if you're on a wide angle lens, uh, that person standing there, the mountain in the background looks like a little tiny hill because tiny, of the way it yeah. decompresses space. You know, it makes things seem farther apart than they really are. So those are things that like, as you get down the line, they're important elements to storytelling and all that, that you can kind of incorporate later. And that's some of the things that you let go of by having all this stuff. But at the end of the day, especially on YouTube, it's all about telling a good story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what, like, if I tell you a good story and I shot the whole thing with a phone, then dude, hell yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you say that the, one of the best performing videos on my channel is that ASMR video that I did last summer and I brought my big camera, but I actually forgot my battery charger. So I started shooting that on the big camera and I had no way to charge my battery once it got low. So I shot the other hours of video on my phone in cinematic mode, which is actually 1080p. And dude, it turned out it's one of the best pieces of, of uh, video I've ever produced and, and for what I think at least and based off viewers and comments. So I, I think it, it all boils down to, again, just how you tell the story. And with that ASMR video, there's no words. So you're telling the entire story with, with video and if you've never tried to do that and you're uh you're aspiring to be you know a videographer and stuff like that do that because that will make you i learned so much in that one weekend of camping than i've learned so far and i'm by no means anywhere near the level that you are like i i 
I produce videos for on YouTube to help people learn how to do stuff, how to work on their bikes, uh, which gear to, to get to get when they go and purchase making an investment on gear. And then I, I like writing, so I like to, to document that. But in the recent couple of years, I've gotten really hooked on trying to produce better quality video. And that's kind of where my passion is now is that like number one is my is motorcycles and number two is videography. So that's kind of why I've started to invest in bigger and better cameras. But, um, I still, you know, I can always be a better storyteller. And I think that's, like you said, is what really hooks people when it comes down to it. Yeah. I mean, I took my camera out of here, but I mean, I have these big professional cameras that I would never take for something like this, but the time that I would, the time that I would use that is, you know, Harley gives me a budget and I'm producing a, a commercial. Like, yeah, then it's like, right. There is a difference in production quality. That's kind of important, you know, and especially if it yeah, airs yeah. on TV or whatever. And, you know, so like that, there's a time and a place, but I think For the sure. biggest thing is, is like, it's all about learning storytelling. Like, I think I, I remember one of the activities I went to film school, kind of, it was like a media art school. But one of my instructors, he had us edit a video together. It was like, we had to make a little documentary. And I think mine came out to like 11 minutes. And then we came back into class and he's like, he's like, we thought we were all going to present our videos. And he goes, okay, guys, you have three days to make this half the length that it is right now. And it has to make sense. And so I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. So I went, I went through. And all of a sudden I realized there was so much stuff in there that could just like filler. It didn't yeah. need to, Yeah, it didn't need to be there. It wasn't like essential for the story. You know, it was like right. I had all this extra stuff that and it's important when you film your own stuff. Like there's a really good book. It's called I think it's called In the Blink of an Eye, and it's really short, but it's about editing. And they talk about the movie editing the movie Apocalypse Now. <laughs> And the, the irony of the the blink of an eye book being really short. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so uh, uh, there's this story though where he's talking about how the director, which I think it's Francis Coppola, right? And um, anyway, the director and the D- DP they 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 like they got a hundred and ten thousand dollars to do this one shot where they're hanging from a crane. And the DP, almost, the cinematographer almost dies and like all this stuff. And so the thing is, at the end of the day, they sent all the film home and that shot never even made it in the edit. And the reason oh, being wow. is because the edit, the the director and the and the cinematographer who went through all of this pain to get the shot weren't there to be like, dude, you don't know how much pain and struggle I went through for that one shot. It has to be in the edit because the editor right. was just looking at things from the standpoint of like, this adds no value to the story. You know what I mean? And I think that that's something that's like really important. Like you and I know, dude, I sweat. I like broke a lens. I blah, 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 blah. This, I, I want this shot to be, I went through so much for the shot to be in there, but at the end of the day, does it, does it actually add any value to your story? And that's the most powerful thing is like, doesn't matter what you do this on. Like it's fun. The gear is inspiring. The gear is it can be like I get a new lens and it may it, it is something where I'm like, I'm inspired. I want to go out and I want to shoot with this new lens. But you know, it's like just remember story, story, story. Yeah. And, and I think to try trying to take some of the emotion out of it because um whenever you're for instance, when I when I rode in Colorado this year, something that drew a lot of emotion out of me, like this this scene that in my own eyes was just amazing and epic. And then you get it on video and it just didn't capture it. And I wanted to put it in there because it, it pulled this emotion out of me, but you know, setting, looking back at it again, I didn't end up putting it in there because it just wasn't, it just wasn't something that was portrayed in the actual video. So you have to kind of think about that just because it's awesome to you or you have this emotion with it. Um, doesn't mean somebody else is going to. And I think video, not only with story, but video should pull emotion out of people when they watch it. There should be some type of motion, emotion that's that's triggered. So uh, we do, we can go into this stuff for a really long time. I think for the viewers and the listeners, I, I think we should probably do some type of like the gear we carry, like what's in our, 
camera box or camera bag on a motorcycle. I think that'll be a good one. I've done that. I've done that in the past, but it's, it's vastly changed since I've done that. So maybe you and I can collaborate on that in the future and, and do a, That'd be cool. do a video, be do a video on that as well for people who are, who are interested. I mean, we may have lost people like 15 minutes ago when we started talking, talking about this because some people just don't care. But, um, I think for you being a professional videographer, I wanted to touch on it just a little bit because you have a, a wealth of knowledge and, um, you don't know it yet, but you're kind of my mentor when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, so you're, you're killing uh, it, dude. I don't, there, I don't know how it, much mentor I can do because you're already ahead of it. It's like, hey, oh yeah, they just came out with these TJI mics. You're like, these ones? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, dude, I'm a sucker. And, and that's the thing, man, the, kind of what we just talked about. I'm a sucker for buying new gear, thinking it's going to make my production better. And it, it will, but we have, you have to know how to use that stuff first. And there's, dude, I got this brand new can or a sony fx30 and i'm like oh this hang has so many buttons i don't even know what all this stuff does but i'm willing to learn so um yeah don't, don't buy a piece of new equipment thinking it's going to change the way things because you'll still make the video if you use it the same way or use it your... i i can <laughs> i have the best testament in the world to that i mean i went out and bought sony's cinema camera they're like the sony venice you know thinking like this is it this is gonna make this is gonna change everything <laughs> And I got yeah. this giant expensive camera that is absolutely stunning when it comes to quality and all that and the features and the tools. But dude, like the support equipment that you need for it, the, the crew that you need to shoot with it, the like, it's just, no, that's not going to make you a better filmmaker. What's going to make you right. a better filmmaker is literally taking your phone and going out and shooting something and editing it together and it being a good story. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. And I, I yeah. like went through a long phase of like thinking like, oh, I'm just going to buy this one more piece of gear. I'm going to buy this one. This yeah. one thing will change everything. And like, dude, I, I don't, I'm trying to get rid of stuff now. You know, yep. like I really, I've gotten to a point now where it's like, dude, do I, I have a steady cam. I just actually shot with the steady cam. I, I have a Super Bowl ad that I'm going to be in um, or some of my shots will be in. Um, but you know, it's like, do I really want to keep doing the Super Bowl or sorry, the steady cam thing? Like it does pay really well, but it's just I don't do it enough. Like I'd rather sell that piece of equipment and build up a razor that I can take and do off road media production. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, I think that'd be sweet. Like it's more in line with what I'm doing right now. And I want to just some things I just want to get rid of. Dude, I have yeah, so totally much. You should see my gear room. It's ridiculous. Like there's yeah, just this yeah. period of time where I was just like, building it up and now it sits there and collects dust you know i do that i do that same thing one or two times a year i do that same thing with moto gear i have all this moto gear that i just you can only you can only wear so much at a time you know so i I just recently went through and kind of cleaned house on that but man i uh, we're looking about an hour and 10 minutes or so right now um about an hour or so i guess because we had some edits but um man i i appreciate your time i know you have kind of a busy day um and you're just a freaking wealth of knowledge if you're listening to this or watching this know that we we are going to be doing things a lot here in the future. We've got some stuff planned and um, I'm hoping, you know, we can get together a couple times this summer and, and really just crush it on some good videography Don't, stuff. Dude, you, really, you, can't, you can't hope, bro. You just got to put it in the gonna calendar. Make it happen, that's right? how it works. It's going to make it happen. Yeah, that's right. That's, all, that's, a, well, that's a, what the biggest lesson I've learned is anybody out there who wants to do an adventure. Let me tell you this. You want to go to New Zealand. You want to go to South Africa. You want to go ride in India put it in the calendar, you know, make, make yourself happen. be like, yeah, like, all right, I don't have enough money in the bank right now to go to South Africa. But if I make my goal that I'm going to go there in November and I have a plan and I know how much it's going to cost, then you can work towards that so that November comes around and there you are. You're flying you off to that South camera Africa. Gear you got, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, man. Well, we'll go ahead and we'll cut it off here, man. I appreciate your time guys. Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, leave a comment down below, let us know what you think. Um, anything you have, any questions you have about videography, uh, just adventure, motorcycle, travel, any of that stuff, uh, hit them, hit us down below. Either me or Justin will comment on it and get back to you as quick as possible. I love the comments. I love the interaction and I love the community that the adventure motorcycle, uh, bikes have done for like me and all the people that i've met so guys if you haven't yet hit that subscribe button as well as that bell icon that way you know when when more podcasts like this are released and we'll see you in the next one